What did you think of the article? Um, well, I, it concerns me because it uh, had a lot of misrepresentations and inaccuracies in it that made the warden service out to look like um, we were corrupt and wasting our resources and our money, and, and much of the information in the article was just completely wrong. Uh, give me a one, two, three, very briefly, of what was wrong. Um, our, our SWAT team tactics as we swept into the quiet town of Allagash that night, um, that, that, that wasn't accurate. The scan well, let's, let's talk about that. You, did, you had 30 game wardens, 33 you said in something like 20 vehicles. We won't talk about the number, but a lot of vehicles into town at 2.30 in the morning. Uh, it wasn't 2.30 in the morning. It was about 6 o'clock at night. It was okay. just after dark. We, we are, by law, we can't even serve a, a search warrant till, um, except for before 9 p.m. Okay. Um, I and, misunderstood that. And so what, um, what occurred there, this, this was a large operation that occurred, that, an investigation that occurred over a two-year period. We weren't there for entirely for two years, but on and off for two years. Um, and it was, uh, it was meant to be a large operation to go in and target some specific individuals who routinely and intentionally break the fish and game laws and, and are not being apprehended by our traditional methods. So we use a, a special investigation to go in and target these individuals, and, um, and that's what we did. And we documented many, many violations, over 300 violations in this investigation. And when it comes time to um, conclude it, in order to gather our evidence and interview the people we need to interview and arrest the people we need to arrest, we get um, search warrants. That's the constitutional process to do that, um, signed by a judge. And when you have five search warrants in a town, um, in order to, to meet your, your needs, each warrant has to have a supervisor there. We have an evidence collection person. We have somebody to interview the person, the suspect or the witness at the household. We have somebody who has to do the searching. And we have somebody that kind of watches our back for safety, kind of watches the street. That's five people. So when you have five warrants, and now you have four to five people at each, you're up to 25. Then you add some administrators like myself and some, some case managers, and, and we're quickly up into the 30 range. So as far as um, um, uh, swap team tactics, there, there, was no, um, there was no armored vehicle or special um, you know, body armor other than what we wear every day and I have on today. We were in our typical game warden uniforms. We drove our same game warden trucks, and we, we came into town and we executed the warrants as required by law. But you, you would have been in bloused boots, and you would not have had that shirt on that you're wearing right now. I very well may tie. have. I, I, I'm in blouse boots. That's our uniform is Were blouse boots. Were you wearing boots. a tie that night? Uh, I don't remember. We have, we have multiple uniforms. We have a field duty uniform. We have a, what we call a Class B. This is what I, as a supervisor, wear almost every day. That night... Is that a Class B right there? This is a Class B. Okay. Yep. That night, I think, um, because it was all field stuff, I think we were all... The uniform was a field duty uniform, sure. which was similar to this. I have blouse boots right now, you know, um, pants, button down the shirt. I don't think we had a tie because right. you're crawling around on floors field, and so field forth. Field stuff. I exactly. Okay. Yep. Um, but in general... I don't want to have it be a yes or no question. You think you're unfairly characterized. You think you're unfairly characterized. How? Uh, because they said we, we, you know, they made it sound like we swept into town like some big uh, tactical military operation. And then the next line was for a, a scanty results that we, we really didn't get anything out of it. A couple of minor fish and game violations. I'm, I'm very happy with the results. Absolutely. We, you said uh, this was a great piece of game warden. I'd say, say that again. You could. This uh -oh. was this was an outstanding piece of of on the ground game warden work. Uh, everything came together. We worked with our partners with uh, the district attorney's office in Aroostook County, uh, with the state police. Uh, we went through all the normal processes that we needed to in order to uh, identify some intentional, um, long term fish and game violators who continue to do so by their own statements and their own actions. Um, we went in, we documented our evidence, we, we um, apprehended them, we charged them, we worked with the district attorney's office. Uh, they had, some of them had a, um, a jury of their peers, went to Superior Court, they were found guilty of that, and they then appealed it to the main Supreme Court, and the main Supreme Court affirmed all the convictions seven to zero. Um, that's, that's how our process works, and, and our scanty results, as the reporter um, um, classified them, uh, were over $39,000 in fines, over 180 days in actually spent in jail. 
more than 80 years of license suspensions and, and more than 75 um, criminal violations of, of multiple counts of like night hunting and hunting, hunting under the influence of alcohol and killing deer during a closed season, killing doe deer in areas where we don't allow that because the deer population is, is so low and so fragile that the legislature has made it an aggravated offense to kill a doe deer there. And these people are doing it routinely all throughout the year and laughing and bragging about it. Let's talk a little bit about that. There's, uh, and you'll know the phrase better than me, but uh, you know that you have to prove a, a predisposition towards committing the crime or something like that. The suspect does. Well, what, what, are you satisfied that you were able to successfully uh, prove that predisposition? We absolutely were. Otherwise, it never would have gone through the jury trial or to the main Supreme Court. Um, we we don't even allow through our review process. We don't even allow most of these cases to. Um, be initiated unless we have predisposition. That's how we, our initial investigation shows that people are predisposed to commit um, game laws. And we found that in this instance um, by the, their criminal history. Some of these suspects had been caught back in 2008 for illegally killing a moose and at nighttime and leaving it. Um, they were charged and convicted of that. And when we um, encountered them in this case, they were still hunting and their licenses were still under revocation. Um, so that shows you that they're not new to it. Um, we then gather up all the complaints that we get from the local citizens in town and the local game wardens and, and the chatter around town about, yeah, this is ongoing, they laugh about it, it's a lifestyle, it's a way of life. They even said in the article, it's a, it's a hit against our way of life, driving around, drinking a couple 12 packs of beer and, and shooting things. Um, so that shows that it's ongoing and then once our warden gets there and begins to interact with these folks, they brag about it and in short time take him out. That's, that's predisposition defined. What did the people of Allagash call a, a deer that was taken early in the year? Uh, in this particular case, one of them um, referred to it as an early bird special. Um, they actually were, were, fee um, they were feeding um, a, a doe deer to our game warden and called it an early bird special. And it was a doe that it was specifically a 140 pound doe that one of the suspects had, had killed during the close season and basically camp meat, as people sometimes call it. And, uh, and again, uh, it's, it's an illegal antlerless deer in an area where you can't kill antlerless deer. It was killed in the closed season, so those are two Class D crimes, but yet it was portrayed in the article to be undocumented deer meat and some onions that they were eating. I would say a, a deer that was killed in, in with two minimum mandatory fines of $1,000 and three days in jail each is more than undocumented deer meat. And, and, and the, the article was, was rife with those misrepresentations. The Northwoods crew, law crew was with you, and there's been a feeling that the department resists honest efforts by media to cover your more controversial things, not piping plovers, but, um, and does its own speaking through its own TV show, and in fact, in this contractual agreement that you have with this, whatever it is, um, you, you, um, you um, at least tip them off to exciting stuff that might make the air and that they're, you know, you know how that might work. It would be, I've got something good. Let's get a crew on this. Um, I, I disagree with some of that because uh, I um, supervise out of the Bangor office and we have three major mainstream media outlets there that I regularly communicate with, regularly involve them in, in our bigger case, our searches and rescues, our, our nuisance animal, our, our criminal. Um, we, we give them press releases on, on um, items such as these takedowns. Um, in this instance, um, the Northwoods Law Crew happened to be with one of the game wardens that was coming up on the detail. Um, there was never any um, involvement with them in the pre-preparation or the post-case follow-up, both of which are extensive. Um, we actually gave them very strict instructions because um, we, we we're concerned about just this, about our tactics getting out. Um, they sent one camera crew up and they, um, um, they shot what they typically would from the roadway, just some really kind of un uninteresting um, footage about guys coming in and out of the house and, and interviewed the typical wardens that, that they were with. Um, as far as the department using them to mess send out our message, um, sure we do that. It's a, it's a very, very successful nationally syndicated um, program that has gotten higher reviews than, than anyone else you see on, on cable TV. 
Um, our goals was to message um, to our youth and to our general public to have a better understanding of what the department does, and I think we were successful with that. Um, but by no means do I think that we exclude the regular mainstream media. We actually have, a, um, in my opinion, a very good relationship with mainstream media. The governor said that the show doesn't portray Maine in a very good light and that he had a, um, a big role in getting it canceled. You'll have to ask the governor about that. I, don't, I, I can't really make comments on his opinion. Um, the, why is the show being canceled? I, I, I think uh, the show already has been. I mean, I, right. there's no more shooting, but uh, it's, it's off the air now. Um, the there's one more cycle, or what I would call a series of new shows that'll go. Right, but as far as the shooting, they're all shot. That's right. Yeah. Right, exactly. Um, as as far as I'm aware, um, the partnership that we had, we had some initial goals. As far as, like I said, just educating the the public as far as what we do, um, trying to help with our recruitment to get new people interested in being game wardens and reach out to our youth. And I think um, we were not only successful with that, but more successful than we really ever imagined we would be. And um, it kind of ran its course, and we wanted to go out on top and have people more so miss what they don't have anymore than kind of let us fall by the wayside and forget what we were about. But there, was, there wasn't a lot more about that in the article other than just them embellishing the, uh, us embellishing the case, which I don't think we did. The article seems to, to feel that, uh, there, there, I think he used the word haughty uh, among the administration uh, of the Department of Inland Fu uh, Fisheries and Wildlife, and um, a lack of um, responsible, uh, actually a lack of responsible response, that's not the right adjective, I guess, toward requests for cooperation from the media, and they cite this FOIA application as a prime example, and in fact, uh, published on social media the email string. Sure. It looked like you guys were stonewalled. Sure. Um, what I can uh, offer about the FOIA process, the, the Freedom of, of Access Act, is um, our staff, our department is regularly FOIAed by, by many outlets, whether it's uh, individual reporters, whether it's people wanting accident reports or case reports or anything. Um, we process all that on our own. We don't have an in-house attorney. We don't have somebody who specializes in FOIAs. We have, we have a uniformed main game warden who is, is computer savvy and can work with our OIT people to, to gather what they need for information. Um, like it or not, the main warden service sends and receives thousands and thousands of emails over the course of, of months and months. We've, we've just like everybody else, we're tied into the digital media world today. Um, so we have uniform staff as well as secretarial staff that sort through these freedom of access requests. Um, so it is standard practice under our policy when somebody gives us one that's fairly general and it's going to create um, an exorbitant amount of paperwork for us cost for them and paperwork for them that we try to work with them to narrow it down. I mean, it's one-on-one. It's -on -one. Somebody calls them on the phone and says, Mr. Smith, um, you put in this FOIA request. You know, you don't need to tell me if you don't want. It's, it's all public information. But if, if you can steer me a little bit more what you're looking for, um, we may be able to expedite this, get it to you faster for less cost, less paperwork for us, and it's a win-win for everybody. That's um, what was initially done in this was try to narrow down the original request. Um, that, that took some time, and I think that, that some people may have felt like we were trying to be resistant for what we provided them. The original search terms, as I understand it, were very broad and would have produced just a, a, a pile of information that would have taken us months to sort through. Um, so we requested that. In the meantime, the requester felt that they were being, as you used the word, stonewalled, or we were being resistant to turn it over. And, um, and they filed a formal complaint through the Attorney General's office against us in that process. Well, now that we have a formal complaint filed against the way that we're interacting with them, we're now going to stop interacting with them one-on-one -on -one, because we already have a complaint filed against us, and we were told by our attorney, who is the Attorney General's office, to fi filter everything through them, which we did, which then, of course, took more time. And the Attorney General's office said we absolutely file followed the uh, statute um, to the letter, and we were well within it, and, and everything, um, um, everything was fine. And, and it, it does take time. Um, we did. We were able to narrow down the search a little bit, and we were able to provide them with, I think, over 230 documents. Whereas the article we're talking about said we only provided them just 35 emails. Um, I, because of that delay in time, I think that's maybe what led a little bit to people feeling like there was some big corrupt conspiracy behind all of this operation. 
Well, I, I can assure you that, like I said, it, it's not. This is just good game warden work. And um, we got information about some people doing bad things to our fish and game resources. That's our mission, is to go catch them. We went and caught them. They had their due process all the way up to the main Supreme Court, and we got some very substantial um, convictions out of them. And, and we continue to comply with that FOIA today, providing them more documents as they come up. We're, we're not hiding anything. Actually, other than the fact that it was a covert case, and we really don't like having all this out there, we want the people to know about it. Uh, we had over $39,000 in fines and 180 days in jail. It, it was good work. Um, there's, there's no secrets here. The, the article left people feeling as if, you know, Allagash is a humble town where people kind of have their way of life and um, that they were just picked out of the, picked out of, you know, made an example of or picked out of the blue, you know, by, you know, by a strong department, which was, in fact, doing a TV show that night. Yes, we were, and we've been doing a TV show for, for multiple years. Um, I'm sure that, that Allagash, parts of Allagash are a humble town, and I'm sure that there are some great people that live there. We know they are. There's some of them that communicate and work with us to give us information. But that we picked people out of the blue, um, just kind of picking on them to make an example of them. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, one person, nine counts of night hunting, three counts of hunting under the influence, five counts of closed season killing of deer and moose, four counts of seeding the bag limit on deer, four counts of illegally hunting antlerless deer, one count of hunting a moose without a permit, a count of um, uh, guiding without a license, one count of possessing an unregistered deer, one count of shooting over your limit of grouse, seven counts of shooting from a motor vehicle. That's one of our primary three, and I could, I could go on with the rest. Mm -hmm. But that's not um, a couple people who were picked out of the crowd and it finds that they um, you know, were, were victimized by us. Uh, so these, are, these are lifelong um, fish and game violators who call their way of life riding around uh, with cases of beer in the vehicle, shooting things out the window in closed season and at nighttime. We caught them and they're upset by it. So they're not, um, they're not scant results? Uh, I don't think that's a scant result at all. I mean, I think that's an outstanding result. Uh, I, I don't know what um, Mr. Woodard's uh, definition of scant is, but that's not by my definition. I mean, we, we detected 300 violations in this, um, in this whole operation. Um, we don't, we rarely, we never charge all the things we detected. You couldn't physically do it. We picked our best cases that had the biggest impact on the resource. Um, in the end, there was 17 defendants, but three were the, the primary, you know, most egregious violators. We convicted them of 75 different criminal charges. And, and one thing to keep in mind, even while our warden wasn't present, these folks killed five illegal deer and shot and killed or at least wounded two moose. So it wasn't as if we were right there with them and, and they would stop if we weren't there. They, they, these people are career fishing game violators. Uh, the undercover warden that was up there uh, is characterized as a guy who drank with them, provided them with a weapon, provided them with a light, etc. And there have been comments by the legislators this week, etc., that um, he broke the law, uh, which, uh, which he may not have technically broken the law for an investigator, but he, he broke the law for a person like me, and that he also broke a, a moral line in trying to entrap these people. That's been a big takeaway of a lot of people. The governor has said that. I know Barry Hobbs, Hobbins said that. Davis from the county said that. Your response to the uh, performance of the investigator? Outstanding. He's one of the best covert investigators in the country. This is not, he's been doing it for 20 years. Um, he did not entrap, entice, induce, persuade anybody. In order for these cases to even reach the authorization for us to move forward with them, we have to show that these folks were otherwise predisposed. That, that means that they were of their own free thought and will to go out and break fish and game laws. You can see that right from their criminal history. You can see that from the, the piece of our undercover game warden request that um, Mr. Woodard put right in his own article. And you could see it from as soon as we arrived up in the town, the conversations we had with them. So they were predisposed. So, so by definition, it's not entrapment. If it was entrapment, that would have been caught up in the district court or in the superior court or in the main Supreme Court. Okay, so, so it, it wasn't entrapment. Our game wardens don't induce or entice anybody. 
does he go along with them? Of course he does. That's part of you need to be present to witness um, these violations. Um, he, he didn't violate the law as far as um, some people have questioned about the fact that he killed a deer um, because there's parts of Title 12 that allow game wardens to violate the law in order to enforce it. And, and I understand that um, some people think, well, that, that's morally wrong in order to catch somebody killing deer. But understand, these folks have been doing this their whole life. They continued to do it while they were there. And for all I know, they're still doing it today. So in order for us to catch them and catch them good like we did, we have to integrate ourselves with them. So he has to ride around with them and make it look like he's drinking. Um, he, he was never intoxicated during uh, the investigation. Actually, I don't think he's ever been intoxicated, to be honest with you. I know him personally. Um, second of all, he, he has to be there with them when they're killing things. And in this case, um, one of the targets had already shot and wounded two deer at nighttime, shot and missed two deer at nighttime because he was so inebriated he couldn't shoot straight. And at one point, they hand the gun to our investigator and say, here, now it's your turn. You kill something. It's an absolute test to make sure he's not a game warden. So at that point, it's, it's laughable or ludicrous to think that an undercover officer is going to say, I can't do that. Uh, it's morally wrong. If you look at the forest from the trees, yeah, we may have killed one deer, which in this case happened to be the deer that the target wounded five days earlier because it had a bullet hole through its leg and it was in the same area. Um, we killed one deer, but think of the deer that we may have saved because of that. Um, it, it, would, it would end the investigation and, and cause our officer undue safety concerns to think that he's going to say, I, I'm not going to, uh, uh, I'm not going to uh, involve myself in the hunting. That's why we're there with him. One other piece I'll add, um, that was the one instance where he did kill a deer after many, many, many nights of hunting with them. On another occasion, the target tried to get um, him and, and the target together to kill a cow and a calf moose, and he was able to, to scare the moose away so that that didn't occur. And on a third occasion, the target um, was going to kill a thread, uh, federally threatened lynx that was in the road. And because our warden was the one who was operating the vehicle and was of sound mind, was able to scoot the lynx out of the road prior to it being shot. So yeah, we, we often drive the vehicle and, uh, and we want to be in control of the situation because some of these folks aren't in the, in the frame of mind where they, they should be in control of the situation. Um. The peaches, was it peaches? It looked like you were trying to confiscate meat. And you went to that lady's house and took canned goods or something. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm guessing what you were trying to confiscate, but I'm assuming that's why you were there. And she's saying she didn't get her stuff back and why they, you know, they, she was scared. There was uh, lasers, there were laser uh, sites pointed at her. In the article, that's what it said. It didn't make it up. I understand it. That's uh, why, she didn't that's get her why peaches we're here. Back. Where's that's, her stuff? Um, what happened there? Several, several, you, you've posed several questions to me. I posed we'll take, one. We'll take them all one at a time. What, 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 what went on with the peaches? First of all, um, that, was, um, that was Ms. Kelly's residence. Uh, the article alluded that we went there with eight or ten game wardens, and she thought maybe she was being robbed, and she didn't know we were wardens. Okay? Uh, we went there with one game warden supervisor and three, and three district game wardens. So four people went to her house, just like all the other warrants I described. Uh, we have a, an audio tape of her, our interview with her and our arrival there. And it's immediately explained, guys are dressed in their BDU uniforms, their field duty uniforms, identify themselves as game wardens, go in, sit down at the table with her and explain to her the search warrant. And she even made the comment to us, well, what, what judge signed that warrant? So she's familiar with, with the process. Okay, so, so the eight or 10 wardens storming her house and her thinking she's being robbed um, is, is a, a, another complete fallacy, okay? Um, we knew that the illegal moose that was killed um, by one of the targets, because our game warden was there, went to her house. We have photos of them posing with the moose quarters on her back deck and um, keeping moose antlers and other moose parts in her shed. It, it's a known fact. The target told our game warden, this is his mother. She cans the moose meat for him. That's why we went there, because we know that the illegal moose meat lives at her house. We go there. Just like anybody else who may have canning, um, she had 60 cans of illegal moose and deer meat. Um, it was in back in its original packaging in cases stacked up, and as our evidence technicians search through it, um, they're finding can after can after can of moose meat. Um, and it was a, a complete 
mistake. Um, it was, it we'll, we'll take full responsibility for it. But in the end, all the cases were taken. And amongst those, there was 93 cans taken. There were 33 cans of vegetables seized inadvertently. We didn't go there for vegetables, obviously not. But where people are, are getting drawn away from this, they were intermixed with 60 cans of a moose that was killed at night during the closed season. Okay, so let's not lose focus here. However, we did inadvertently seize 33 cans of, of vegetables. Um, on March 3rd, we received a call that we seized some stuff that wasn't evidence. And on that so on that same day, we returned those 33 cans to her um, and she signed a receipt saying she got them back. Um, as far as these other peaches or whatever she's talking about that she never returned, I don't know anything about them. We seized 93 cans, we re 33 of them were vegetables, we returned them. The other 60 cans were Ill illegally canned moose and deer meat, which is a class D crime to possess them because it was a moose killed in the closed season and at night. Let's not lose focus about the issue here. Have you talked to uh, Colonel Wilkinson and, and um, um, Commissioner uh, Woodcock about this? Uh, the, the Colonel, I have regular discussions with him about you know daily uh, you know operations, but uh, not a lot with the Commissioner, no. Why were you chosen to come here today? I supervise the Special Investigations Unit. This this is I'm the supervisor of this of this um, operation. Okay. So allegations against the department um, that there's a, uh, an unhealthy relationship with Northwoods Law are in your bailiwick or not in your bailiwick? Uh, not in my bailiwick, but I, my involvement and what I know from being a, a lieutenant, um, I think our relationship with Northwoods Law is, is good. I mean, it's 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 over as far as the field shooting portions of it, but I, uh, every interaction I've had with them has been outstanding and I have communicated with their staff when they were in my division and um, it was always, at least from my seat, um, positive and continues to be. Um, and you're saying that the Department of IFNW never came up with um, ideas for what would make good shoots for Northwood Law? Northwoods Law? I wasn't really part of what would make good shooting. I, I, we do, um, and again, I hope this isn't the focus of the story, because the focus is the article. But when Northwoods Law was in my division, if we knew that something more interesting than the everyday riding around checking a fisherman was occurring, sure, we would, we would send them that way, but we didn't, we didn't stage things for it. Um, if, if a game board happened to have Northwoods Law there and the, and the next section over um, was, was going on a drowning or a search, we'd say, hey, come over to the drowning of the search. It's more interesting than riding around seeing if anything's going on today. But it wasn't staged, so to speak, no. Okay. Uh, I just want to give you a chance to say anything you want to say because we've talked a lot and sometimes the, when I finally get around to asking the questions, I don't ask sure. them exactly. Um, but in general, you want to say, I just, we, um, our, our concern as a department is that the recent article that was published um, in the Portland Press Herald um, looked, uh, painted it as if, uh, didn't even paint it, it was, was full of misrepresentations and inaccuracies about um, an operation that two years ago we had in the, uh, in the Allagash region. Um, it, it, misled the public to think that we have a, a corrupt investigative warden that, that worked that case, um, where none of that can be further from the truth. The article is, is rife with inaccuracies that we can, um, we can um, um, show that um, they're, they're untrue, and I believe that the Bureau will be coming out, or if they haven't already, with a, uh, a document that contests many of those, as I have here today. Mm -hmm. Um, and really that operation was um, what I would describe as a, a great piece of, of game warden work. I mean, we, we worked with the public and um, with our local wardens to identify serious fish and game violators. That's our mission to try to catch them. Um, when traditional means was not working for us, um, we put an untraditional means in there. Um, we put a, a covert game warden in there and he immediately um, affirmed what we knew was going on or we had information that was going on. Um, 
he, he caught the three main targets and, and subsequently some of their associates. Uh, they all had their day in court right up through a uh, found guilty by a jury of their peers and then appealed it to the main Supreme Court that affirmed our actions and our work and all the convictions. Um, and I really think that any article portraying that um, should have been uh, should have been much more about the positive aspects. That's that's why we're here. And instead, it was full of misrepresentations. And really, um, what what most upsets us is uh, is this investigative reporter, whatever his motivations were, whatever his issue is with the bureau, um, took it upon himself to to try to slander us, one of our staff members, as well as took what he knew to be an undercover police officer's face, whether you agree with what we do or not, or whether a mission is or not, and posted it all over social media and on a major uh, media outlet and said, this guy is an undercover game warden, without knowing if he was still working, working that day. Um, that came out last Sunday. Uh, our investigator may have been in with the next group of bad guys when that posted. And, uh, and we think that that totality, that's irresponsible reporting, and it's completely inaccurate. I want to challenge that. Where was he last Sunday? You should know where that investigator was last Sunday. Was he indeed in a dangerous place? I, I know, I'm not going to comment on what our um, um, where our staff is. I mean, that, that may further compromise other investigations. But you just made a serious allegation. You said he may have been somewhere. He may have been. Was he or wasn't he? It's, it's, that's not important whether he was or not. The fact is he is a sworn state law enforcement officer who the reporter knew was an undercover person. His identity is the most important thing to him, Bill. And this reporter, in order to try to, to show that he thinks that there's some big conspiracy over the fact he was, he thought it would took too long to get some emails, um, put his face out all over social media and the paper. That puts our staff in danger. It compromises our operations. And just like he doesn't know where he was last Sunday. I'm not going to tell this media outlet where our investigators were last Sunday. It's, it's, it's not important. That's, if, if we told people where we were every day, we wouldn't be effective as game wardens. Not knowing where we are is what makes people comply with the law much of the time. Okay, so again, let's, let's keep the focus on where it is. The focus isn't on where the investigator was last Sunday. It's that somebody knew somebody was an undercover police officer whose identity is clearly the most important thing for him, his most important tool, and he blasted it all over the place without, without any thought of what the, the outcome of that may be. These, these aren't everyday violators, guys fishing without licenses uh, that we're dealing with. I mean, these, these, some of these people are violent criminals. Our staff, uh, undercover staff, has had their lives threatened before. We've had to have put watches on their homes um, after these cases have come down. Okay, so, um, so his, his tactic of, of outing this, I think, was... Um, um, inappropriate reporting, let alone the fact it's full of misrepresentations and inaccuracies.